Hi there, so uh, here's a very quick breakdown of the principles behind this uh, spiderweb material here. Uh, I thought it would be an interesting challenge, but uh, really, it's very, as you can see, it's relatively simple. And, um, well, let's, let's get started. We're uh, using the tile random simply to be able to uh, stick this to X switch off the split. And like this, we can have... Uh, Random, uh, random separations between our bands here. If we turn the interstice off and give it a random color, then we get what we're going to need to uh, use an ed edge detect on later on. Now uh, we can increase the number of columns. And if we feed this through uh, Cartesian to polar coordinate, We'll very quickly get to the basis of our spiderweb pattern here. Uh, so just to be able to control the size of uh, the webbing here, as you can see in the material, there's a few parameters exposed, including the size. What we're going to do is use the exact same method to generate the concentric lines here. So with the X we're going to use Y. Give it a bit more random Y, and instead of a Cartesian to poly node, we're going to use a shape mapper. So the shape mapper does pretty much the exact same thing as a Cartesian to poly node, except with a, a few uh, added parameters. So if we stick our radius to zero and our width to one, we'll get um, a full circle, the um, a full disk containing all, all the data from our tire random here. And uh, this here can be used to uh, control the size then later on. And of course, you'll still be able to control the amount of lines you get in here. Um, the only real subtlety is that if you want to uh, sync this, oops, sync these two together. So here, basically, we're driving all our, all our data through two cartes into poly nodes at the top because we want to have the uh, values going uh, outside of the disk limit. The lines to be able to continue as far as we want, but in the inside uh, webbing part here, we have to use a shape map up here to be able to control the size. And what we really need to do is to rotate these 180 degrees so that they get the same alignment as with the uh, with the Cartes into poly node. We have the same orientation. With the value Cartesian to poly node simply by rotating the 180 degrees the shape mapper. So uh, if we go back to the simplified version, if uh, we edge detect both of these, very slow values, you'll very quickly see how we get uh, our spider webs. So this is the uh, very basic outline of the material. I want to this to be slightly slightly smaller for aesthetic purposes. And uh, basically all the rest on this is uh, just adding uh, some general warps to all our data so that they warp uh, give it a nice little wobble along those lines. Yeah, look a little bit more naturalistic. But um, the slightly more interesting version is uh, point is uh, how to get this um, sort of gravity tension, I've called it a tension map, um, on the lines that you'll see in all spider webs. So you'll see that at the bottom there, uh, obviously they don't uh, go upwards, gravity will be pushing them down, but you still see a bit of that, uh, a little bit of that tension. And uh, at the top is where it's uh, mostly apparent. So uh, the way we do this, that we're th simply going to run an edge detect on our uh, coaxial lines there, but if you just run a flood fill straight through it, you'll see it doesn't work simply because uh, there aren't any uh, edges for it to detect. It uh, can't find any shapes to flood to actually flood fill. So uh, to fix that, we simply add a transform node and we just uh, reduce uh, the vertical size, very a vertical scale, very slightly. So that there's an edge that the flood fill can then find and uh, give us all our uh, very useful values.
Then using that flood fill, we can use a, another mapper, which is a time of flood fill mapper, and uh, simply feed it to gradient linear, just to have that a nice soft bump. Uh, the only important parameter here is to use size mode fit shape to bounded box. Just so the sizes don't grow outside of our different shapes. And uh, then basically we just uh, add in some very slight amounts of noises to vary up the tension very slightly. And uh, we are cutting off a bit more of the bottom part here with the, this uh, very simple setup here. because uh, otherwise you'll get some strange artifacts around the edges here where it will detect uh, extra edges and uh, the weird warping will look uh, extremely unnatural. So uh, once we've got, uh, oh yes, one last point, we also want to have a flood fill to bound in box even from that uh, flood fill and uh, we want to distance this and then auto level it so that we get this nice value where uh, white is the biggest band and uh, Probably black is the smallest band because uh, otherwise the, the distortion, the directional warp we're going to apply is going to apply uh, too much on the smaller bands compared to the bigger bands. So uh, just to get the natural look here, we simply multiply our bounding box uh, about 50% over our, uh, our default uh, tension map, let's call it. And uh, simply the, the gravity doesn't affect, or tension map doesn't affect the bottom parts. We're using another gradient linear. This one is a, an actual linear one, not the nicely rounded one. Uh, invert it and just uh, shift it, uh, in this case, to the right. Because uh, then once we use uh, our actual concentric line uh, data, once we shift it up, this part here will end up on top. And that will give us uh, this nice little uh, gravity uh, tension effect. Um, then really, as I said, it's just uh, adding some general warps of the material over all of our different values. Uh, I like to use uh, channel, uh, the channeling method, channels method of uh, Joshua Lynch just to keep uh, things clear where each uh, data channel is uh, nicely visible. Like that, it's easier to keep stuff in, th in sync this here. All our conversions to polar coordinates happens all in the same uh, vertical uh, area of the graph. Same here, our large scale warp happens uh, at the same area of the graph. Like that, it's a bit easier to find uh, when you go back into your material later on. Um, one other slight uh, detail here you'll see there's some little random webbing parts that are uh, added just to give it a bit more sort of uh, organic variation now we're just uh, multiplying our two uh, uh, our two concentric and coaxial line uh, data maps together to get this run an edge detect run a flood fill and a flood fill to random uh, grayscale value and uh, like this, we can use a histogram scan to select only certain portions, and you can expose this uh, just to be able to add uh, well, like this random webs just to add more of them. But I uh, find it uh, looks nicer if you keep it quite subtle. And uh, then you can just uh, run this data through uh, the same directional warp we're using on the rest of our data here to give that uh, gravity effect. Then uh, run it all through this same shape mapper well, through the shape mapper with the same parameters as the rest and another warp and then uh, we're just multiplying it over a smaller version of this because uh, as I said earlier if uh, we leave the exterior portions of a uh, if we leave the exterior portions of this we'll get some slightly artifacty edges like this here so we just want to get rid of them. And uh, we can use this map here to simply alternate between a simple uh, coaxial line data and uh, cells node just to add uh, 
these very small portions of webbing here and uh, then just bring uh, everything together to get the complete uh, material so the only portion you haven't seen yet is uh, this outer webbing part and uh, I haven't really found a very um, perfect way to do this as you see it's still uh, the edge is quite dirty here but um, the way I'm doing it here is uh, we're simply using uh, lots of uh, versions of the Starburst node Starburst uh, simply with the larger and larger and uh, shorter and shorter parameters so that uh, once we add them all together we get something that resembles the outside of a line so the only reason I'm using a pixel processor here is that I'm not entirely sure why but uh, if uh, we use a histogram scan which is what uh, we would use normally we still get, uh, even with contrast to 1, we still get this uh, strange edge here. So I had to guess, I'd assume it's got something to do with the, the data being actually 8-bit instead of 16-bit. This is just a guess. So simply to get uh, rid of this, we're using a very, very basic pixel processor. Where we're using the pixel position value, of course, sampling that. And then we just use a greater than 0 0.001 and uh, if it's greater than return 1 if it isn't return 0 and this will give us our nicer uh, binary black and white 0 and 1 uh, mask that uh, we can then use to uh, run an edge detect on so simply the smallest portion of this we don't actually want to be part of this because we don't want the edge detector to add any thickness to the line so the very thinnest and longest starburst uh, node we're simply going to uh, run a histogram scan on right up to get our nice line and then just uh, send that out and uh, just use that straight up deleting the inner portion so it's just this minus this which gives us this which uh, we can now add to the rest and we get this nice uh, relatively nice uh, exterior webbing onto which we can add another cells node uh, at a larger scale just to add that uh, random webbing on the outside and then bring in our actual web part to get uh, the final product and uh, just some very small warp and uh, a little bit of a blur, very low value, 0.15 because what we're getting out of this is just purely black and white lines and we want it to have a, a little bit of a brightness around it too. the light can catch it uh, a bit as if it was a, an actual line, a round line and uh, then it's just uh, putting some very basic roughness and uh, color values in and uh, this is it really so uh, as always, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, if you've got any sort of uh, critique, comment, whatever, questions, don't hesitate to uh, contact me on OnStation. Have fun!